So we will call the Wednesday, January 15th, 2020, Community Preservation Act Committee meeting to order. Um, today's agenda is to hear from uh, applicants who have been deemed to be eligible for funding um, out of the historic preservation uh, account of um, funding and with an exception that we also have Holyoke Housing Authority here um, under the housing category, affordable housing category. Um, that's our only agenda items for today, so we can jump right in. Um, the first is uh, the Armory Building, Marcos Marrero and Ben. Um, we'd ask for approximately five minutes of presentation from each um, applicant, and then we'll try to limit our questions to somewhere in the neighborhood of five minutes, so we're, we won't be here for 40 hours. Um, so with that, Marcos and Ben, if you're ready, we're ready. Uh, Marcos Marrero, Director of Planning and Economic Development. Uh, we're the applicant. I'll, I'll give the mic over to Ben Murphy, who's the project manager uh, on this project and also staffs the Historical Commission, uh, which has as a high priority saving, uh, saving the former armory building. Thank you. Um, as Marco said, I'm Ben Murphy. Um, and for the most part, we don't have any major updates on the application we, we handed in, but I'll just go over a few points I, I'd like to make. Um, so we're talking about the armory at 163 Sargent Street, which is on the, the top of the list of the city's priority endangered properties. It's literally number one on the list. Um, I think most of you are familiar with it. We, we applied with a slightly, um, with a, a different application last year. Um, and currently we're working with an architect and engineer through a mass development grant to look at how to redevelop the project, uh, the property, how to, um, what the problems are, how to fix them, the budget. And we're, it, unfortunately we're looking at possibly not being able to salvage the interior spaces because the floor systems are in such, such rough space, um, in such rough shape. I, there's a couple pictures of that in, in the handouts. The, the back two pages show some of the deteriorated floors. So the middle section where you enter the building is pretty solid, but on either side the floors are, are dangerous. Um, so the possibility is to save the facades. We're looking into that with the architect and engineer and hopefully we'll have um, better information a little bit later on. The most, the assumption is that the most likely reuse of this property is an institutional user who's interested in a signature building that might be interested in helping redevelop it or a project like housing, but that would need significant subsidies. And the assumption with the budget we provided was that it included new construction where the old drill shed was in back. Um, so that's why the budget is where it is. That's not just the restoration of the historic headhouse that's left because it, we don't think that that in and of itself would support a project without a, another piece to it in the, in the rear. Um, is there anything else I missed? Uh, just, to, just to make clear that uh, the last round when we applied for CPA funding, it was somewhere around $125,000. It was primarily for pre-development work. It was not for bricks and mortar work, and that was one of the concerns of the, of the committee, that there was a, an, industry, an interest in prioritizing bricks and mortar. Uh, we subsequently took uh, a portion of that scope of work that you saw last year, and that's what we use to secure the technical assistance and the engineering and architects that are looking at the building right now for reuse through mass development. So it's a free service and the value of $45,000 provided to, to the city at the moment. So we went ahead with a portion of that. Uh, and th on this occasion, we're asking for, for funding for future development of the, of the property under the, uh, the guide of what Ben just described. And I'll, I'll just also add that out of 
the the request we asked for the the masonry work is really the the most important of the the three items we listed which was masonry windows and roof the masonry is is going to be the the number one priority for for anybody to save the building so with that are there any questions you might have any questions And I do want to make a comment, uh, and I should have done this before you started. It's not in, in response to anything that you've had to say. Um, this is our second funding cycle, um, and we have significantly more applicants than we had in the first funding cycle, and we have 60% of the funds that we had in the first cycle. So we're looking at applications, um, totaling approximately $2 million, and we have uh, probably about $600,000 worth of available funds. So um, just to put in context what these requests represent as a percentage of available funds. Um, so, and again, that's not in response. You have a large request, and it, you know, it, it is. But I, I think I would ask, um, for everybody to keep that in mind, including you guys, and if you have something you want to add about, you know, why this four hundred thousand dollars should be, the committee should consider that it's as a, a priority. Um, other than what you've already had to say, I would encourage you to do that. And I, if I may, I just want to clarify for the public as well as for us the idea of doing the masonry work. You know, all of this physical work is basically to enable the building to be sold to someone who can use it for some sort of commercial or residential development. So it won't be you know, permanently on the city's rolls. We're doing this so that it becomes economically viable to develop, right? Uh, yes and no. So the, the, the idea is that the city wouldn't do this work. A developer would do the work on the, because it would, it would cost the city quite a bit more to actually Prevailing manage wages. the project. Gotcha. But yes, it would be it wouldn't be city owned going forward. The the plan would be to sell it to somebody to develop it. Yeah, so this is a developer incentive kind of deal. But it would That's be different it, because we're not doing the pre um, exploration work. We're doing the brick and mortar work in partnership with whoever the developer is. Correct. It would be earmarked specifically for for the the items listed. Okay. Thank you. So th this would be akin to what the CPA committee did last round with 123 Pine Street, uh, where again the city isn't doing the repair work; the developer would be. So to the extent that uh, if if something were not to happen in the future, the risk to the public taxpayer is zero because no expenditures would happen. Our concern would be if we were to make improvements, partial improvements on a site that isn't fully developed, that that investment depreciates very quickly. Uh, I also want to address the, the, the comment because it's a very, very valid concern. Um, and it would be, if it was a question for us, it would be, it, it would be the right question. Um, two things I would say to that. Number one, it is uh, the most historic site that the city controls at the moment. Um, and so to the extent that historic preservation is a priority in the city, I would, I would ask you to consider that. Uh, number two is I would um, just I don't want to say remind you, I'm sure you're very well aware of, of this, but that the CPA uh, funds can be used uh, towards paying back a bond. So we wouldn't necessarily have to pay out of pocket $400,000 in one round as, you know, as a committee that recommends to the executive and the legislative branch on how to assign these monies. Um, certainly I think there would be a way for us to use the funds through, through a bond expenditure and then, you know, being it being being paid back in four or five years, something like some to that extent. Thank you. Anybody else? Comments, questions? Um, I'm just wondering, um, you don't have a developer though who's expressed interest at this point, right? We we have had multiple interests uh, over over the years. The the problem is the building's condition scares folks away. Uh, we are working on the first part of not getting people scared away, which is getting certainty on the structure itself. Uh, and a better understanding of the cost. We should have that squared away closer to March and at the end of March of this year. Um, so we just haven't been able to secure anyone without a better understanding of the asset. 
We would also say that uh, the challenge with the asset is that even though it has great historic value, it would be a long shot to secure federal and state historic dollars uh, tax credits for these because part of it has already crumbled and additional internal demolition would be substantial, therefore decreasing the value of historic preservation to state and federal agencies. Mike? Yeah, I would just, uh, first of all, remind um, everybody last year when this came before us, I think we were looking at 150, we all, 150,000 as an incentive. Um, and we were pretty much, I thought, uh, unanimous that it needed a lot more than that. I, I'm glad they've come forward with something that would really attract an investor. We need to, aside from the historic aspect of it, we really need to attract investment in this neighborhood. Uh, I think everybody's aware of what went on uh, this weekend with the shootings in the neighborhood. We've got people that have invested in the Churchill homes. Uh, they've uh, put a substantial financial, emotional uh, investment in the neighborhood. They need all the support we can give them. Uh, this is a, a key piece in that neighborhood. Uh, and then from the historic aspect, uh, just uh, to continue with the neighborhood improvement and support the people in that neighborhood, I, I think if we don't do something soon, we're, we are gonna be looking at losing a historic structure we are going to be tasked with tearing it down. So, anybody else? Comments, questions? I mean, so and 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 any. That's what I was going to ask. You. Any public comments or questions? Anybody would like to feel free. Do I have to state my name and address? Okay, uh, Laura Clampett, 182 Locust Street. Uh, um, so I live, you know, down the street from the armory. I'd love to see it, you know, become a viable building again. Um, I guess my one question about this uh, proposal, with it being a developer incentive, if a developer is not secured within a certain amount of time, what happens to the money? Um, you know, because I'd also, I guess, hate to see the $400,000 tied up with a, a plan that's not moving forward. Um, so, you know, and then also, I guess, with that, um, have any effect on future ability for uh, the armory or, you know, to apply for CPA funds for other projects or to, like, increase the incentive to developers. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So uh, after a certain period of time, it would go back into the general fund of the CPA, and that would come, were it to be awarded, there'd be a time restriction on that. And that is one of the issues that we try to take into consideration when we're evaluating the projects. You know, we don't want to have a lot of money sitting out there on contingent projects, but so. Anybody else, anybody else have anything in the audience? All right, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. All right, so agenda item, or the second presenter would be um, the Victory Theaters, murals, Kathy McKeon and Don Sanders. And again, I just want to add this into the introduction. Um, uh, Marcos and Ben for Armory were asking for uh, $400,000, and um, this is a $100,000 request from the Victory Theater. And Don and Kathy? Yep. <laughs> Hello, uh, I'm Don Sanders. I'm the Executive Artistic Director of MIFA Victory Theater, and Kathy McKean. The Managing Director of MIFA Victory Theater. Uh, we have a, a slideshow to show you, uh, but I have to say, um, just to put this uh, in a certain perspective, the Victory Theater is a 1,600-seat Broadway-sized theater. Those of you who drive by Suffolk Street and see uh, what looks like a rather blank facade will be amazed if you have not been inside. This is a Broadway house that was built by um, very famous Broadway theater designers, architects uh, in uh, 1919, it opened in 1920. Uh, it is the last remaining 
Broadway-sized and style theater in the entire Connecticut River Valley. And in, for that reason, it is ex an extraordinary economic development factory to bring uh, joy and uh, people into our wonderful city because um, it will attract six to eight Broadway touring shows every year. That's the great uh, grade A shows along with other specialty shows, uh, music tribute shows and opera and ballet and dance uh, from all over the world. This will really be a tourist attraction and we have it here in our city. So that's why we're working on it. And uh, tonight, it's very exciting to be able to be asking for money for something. These We are asking for money for help with the restoration of the murals inside the theater. And if you look at the screen, you, that what you're seeing in black and white there is, on, is the proscenium size of the stage. And the murals go on either, where they are those elliptical um, curved topped spaces on either side of the blank center. That's where the murals go. And I do want to say that the murals replaced in 1942, what had been boxes. How many people sitting there have been into a Broadway house recently uh, or a show where you see people sitting in the boxes on either side? So that's what was here in this theater. In 1942, it became primarily a movie theater and they removed the boxes. Why? Because kids would be sitting in the boxes and that blank screen that's in the middle there, they would do puppet shows or throw popcorn boxes in front of the uh, only some kids would. So here we are inside the current house, the, the theater, and there is the red uh, uh, a teaser across the proscenium stage, and on either side you see the two elliptical spaces where in 1942 uh, the Goldstein brothers invited one of, it turns out to be one of the most famous WPA artists, Vincent Merg, Got Maragliati to do murals on either side. And I don't want to go so far as to say uh, we have a Da Vinci in our midst, but they are very famous pictures. He's a very, very famous artist and becoming even more known. Uh, his studios were in Grand Central Station and he uh, did uh, decors for the Waldorf Astoria. Uh, and Pennsylvania uh, State House. He is a very, very widely known. So here he is, like everything else in Holyoke, we have this great theater and we have these murals inside it. When we went in front of the Massachusetts Historic Commission, and we're very proud of the results, they did a thorough, and I, you at some point should see that whole report, a thorough report about the value of the Victory Theater to come to the conclusion that it must be restored and to date we have $10 million in historic tax credits based on the experts who have gone through the theater. And they came back, and this is what's fascinating. We could have put the boxes back up, but in fact, they could not find any material pictures that really showed how the boxes look like. And so they ruled that the, and I'm glad personally, uh, that ruled that the murals should go back up. They should be restored and go back up because they are such valuable and historic and artistic uh, works. And there they are. Uh, so uh, on one side, on the right-hand side, you can see faintly, again, this, these pictures were taken when uh, before they were taken down to be restored, uh, they are faded, etc. On the right hand side, on the left hand side, you see the really damaged condition that they came to be in uh, from water damage, etc., etc. And that is not scary. Uh, that happens. We were fortunate in that they're painted on canvas. Uh, Vitek Kruda took down uh, the canvas. A very and there are pictures of that happening. We did that with a grant from the Historic Preservation. Trust, Cynthia Woods Mitchell. And I know that Olivia Moselle is somewhere in here in the house celebrating her birthday, and she's the one who got the money for that to be done. Hooray, Olivia. <laughs> Happy birthday. Um, so the, the, um, th they were on uh, canvas, they've been taken down, and now as we approach the full restoration of the theater, it is time to have uh, VTech uh, re actually restore them and put them back up. 
uh, the, uh, uh, where they belonged. Uh, now here is Vincent Bragliotti. Um, those of you who love pictures of artists, I think this is such a great picture. He lived to be 90 years old, and he was, um, uh, he was born in Sicily originally, came to America, and really became a famous uh, mural artist. Uh, and um, it's just, again, I can't stress how much, how wonderful it is for us to have something by somebody like this in our city. It, in and of itself, of course, there'll be great shows in the theater, but some people will come and just to see how beautiful the theater is and see these murals. Uh, the League of Broadway producers in New York said, did a study, and among the attractions for audiences to theaters is not just the show, it's the actual fact of being inside a historic theater. Uh, so it's very important that we do this right. Um, here are some examples of his other works. Uh, and uh, the WPA program, Works Progress Administration, was started by uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and it was a way to use artists and do infrastructure all across America. It's so great that we've got these here in Holyoke, and frankly, that they can be saved and have been saved. Uh, here's Vitek Kruta, who uh, is a wonderful and very credentialed uh, restoration expert, uh, in addition to running Gateway City Arts. And the pictures that you saw, the, there's a Vitek at work, um, maybe in Czechoslovakia. Uh, but that's the same Vitek that we know. And he has already taken down the murals, and they are stored, and they are will be uh, uh, restored in his studios over an uh, in Holyoke, which I think is also great. Um, uh, here is, a, uh, I think you have this in the application. I'm not going to go through each one of the points. But the, again, because all of this was really so carefully and professionally put together by experts that we had to have from the Mass Art, uh, Historic Commission, we really have an extraordinarily uh, professional and great plan about what will happen. Uh, this is about Evergreen, Evergreen Architectural Arts. Evergreen are the folks that will be doing the rest of the interior in uh, the Victory. And uh, part of our application is that the walls around the proscenium need to be uh, 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 fixed and made uh, safe and, uh, 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 and uh, aesthetically so that the murals will be reinstalled in their place. And this is something about Evergreen. Again, I'm pretty proud of the team that's working on the Victory Bar and Bar construction who built the original Radio City Music Hall and did the restoration of Radio City Music Hall are doing the Victory. So this is a rendering of, if you're sitting up in the upper balcony of the Victory, of there, there, there are the um, uh, murals on either side of the proscenium stage and uh, you see to the wall treatments that they will be placed in that Evergreen uh, will be responsible for. Uh, it's going to be just a really beautiful, wonderful, exciting place to be. You can also find a copy of the slideshow on Misa's website, which is at the top. All right. Thank you. Anybody have any questions? Committee questions? No. I have one, and I apologize if the application already answers this, but I just took a quick look at the draft contract for the previous funding cycle, and if nothing changed, the date at which that funding expires, if the project is not completely funded and you know, up and running, is December 1st, 2020, which is coming on us very quickly. So in light of that, and in light of the fact that as far as I know, the only tangible progress toward the construction is that you've acquired that extra property you need to complete the site plan, you know, where are you and yeah. what's the timeline? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Uh, we're happy to answer that. Um, that we that has been a very important acquisition, 134 Chestnut Street, and um, we also now have permission to use that property to put the architectural addition to the victory that is part of the project. And we couldn't really do anything until that we had that property. Our, we are expecting to have a soft part of the theater uh, uh, done in December 2020 and going for like a full opening in 2021. 
so progress. I, I have to, I've always had to say this, and it breaks my heart to say it, because we've had to wait, too. Historic restoration projects that employ tax credits are not incremental. You have to have the full amount of money in order to go to the contract with the architects. So it all happens at once. Yeah, of course, and yes. we've been very aware of that. I know and you that's have been why very... the <laughs> you know, recurring yeah. question about how close are you to that 100% funding, because we yes. all know that that's what's required. Yes, it, that's absolutely right. So uh, we, are, we are in an absolute sprint to complete the final. We have basically raised nearly 70% of the total cost of the whole project, and we have a, a very excellent plan to put the sums that are necessary to go to contract with the contractors uh, so that the construction work begins. We don't need all of the money to open the theater. That's in the, uh, the master budget. Okay, so if the committee were to agree to this grant and we imposed the same 2020 December 1st deadline, that would not be a problem for you? It, well, uh, I think that's what we would want to do, absolutely, absolutely, okay. absolutely. We think it's a very fair, <laughs> a very, very fair, and as, you know, we're under that pressure, it also helps us in the fundraising to say, look, you know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. we got this pressure, uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yes. You're welcome. Thank you. Anybody else on the committee have a question? Comments? Anybody in the audience have a comment or question on this proposal? Looks like we're good. Thank you, Don. Thank you very much. I, I, whenever I say to people everywhere, I just have to give a shout out to how great the CPA Act is. People are so impressed that something like this exists where people are trying to use money and using it well to save beautiful things in our cities. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So we're on to applicant number oh, yeah. three, Great. which is the Wisteria Hearst ele Electrical Upgrade, uh, Kate. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Thank you. All right. Is this going to match what's on the screen? Oops. It is going to? Yes. Hopefully. It matches. Did everybody get one? Right here. Can I can use one? You have one more? Thank you. I do. Oh, I got it. Oh, no, we're all set. I had it. I was hoarding. I'm Kate Preisler. For those of you who haven't met me, I'm the director about Wisteria Hearst. Um, and I apologize, I have a little bit of cold, so just let me know if you can't hear me clearly. Um, this is a pretty straightforward project. Uh, it's a really crucial one, and um, so I'm just going to walk through some slides. They match your packet right there. Um, for those of you who have not been to Wisteria Hearst, um, the building that I'm talking about is the main house building there. Um, we have two buildings on site. The carriage house to the left was redone in 2010. Um, so that's pretty up to date, and that's where our electricity is sourced into. So the origin point that feeds the main house is secure, but the main house um, is what we're talking about and looking at. That's a pretty crucial situation. Um, for those of you, again, who don't know, Wisteria Hearst is a historic estate owned and operated by the city of Holyoke. Um, over 10,000 people attend concerts, art shows, lectures, tours, and other programs each year. Um, we've been really... Uh, proud to have our numbers um, not only retain um, strength but grow a little bit in recent years. The depth of our programming has grown strong, um, particularly around the use of that music room and outdoor concerts, different kind of cultural events that happen there in addition to um, all of our historical programming. Um, so the areas we're talking about are the ones that are most used, see the most people, um, and are the integral historic portions of the estate. Um, we're In this project, we're requesting funds to update uh, decaying and unsafe wiring and um, equipment in the house. Um, 
It is uh, something that we've been looking at a long time. It's long overdue at Wisteria Hearst. You'll have seen in our applications that some of our fuse boxes and panel boxes date back to the 1930s. We've really seen um, a decay in all systems in the main house in the last three years. So you may also have noticed um, if you're an attendee of Wisteria Hearst that our programs have been getting a little bit smaller and a little bit slimmer, particularly on the side of um, any events that require a, a large electrical load, like a concert, anything with lighting, um, some of the outdoor concerts we had been experimenting with, we've really been reducing. And I would say in the upcoming year, we're kind of at the deadline. Um, this past year, we've been able to keep people safe. Um, I'm not really worried about public safety, but even just being able to um, present in those spaces has been very challenging. We're losing um, lighting fixtures, we're losing uh, different outlets and fuses. The fuses in the fuse boxes in the main house in particular are um, showing some signs of wear and tear and inability to keep up. Um, the load in the house is also lower than what really should be required for a house that also, remember, houses our city department. So we have computers, a lot of computers, printers, um, you know, all the equipment, servers, Wi-Fi, um, and we really don't have the, the power capacity to be running what we do. Um, in 2018, uh, when our new city engineer came on, we, uh, we took a look at this project because we knew it was something that really needed to be addressed. And Bob was able to walk through with an engineer from a consulting firm, Mont McDonald. And so everything you see in our plan comes out of that walkthrough. Um, and here's with those recommendations. Because it is um, electrical in scope, there is always some mystery to it. Um, once they're in there, they kind of have to follow and um, keep fixing things until it's up to code. So this project, um, one of the complicated issues with it is that we need to have the bulk of the money in hand um, right when we start work in order to prevent an indefinite closure of Wisteria Hearst. Um, and we, that's just something that I think, um, you know, an entity of our scale and size, an indefinite closure is really hard to come back from. So every, this whole plan, the funding plan, is designed to be done all at once um, with money in hand. And that's where CPA can really help us out. Uh, phase one is in progress right now. We were awarded CDBG funds last year um, to create record drawings. We don't have any uh, schematics or anything for the house building plans that um, include the electrical. So the first step to do this in a really responsible and um, historically uh, uh, responsible way is to, to get the plans, get a sense of what's in there, um, get some maps so we can use those in the future as well. Um, during that time, we're also going to put together the final construction plans and specifications, which will then um, be, re re uh, excuse me, be reviewed by a historic preservation consultant who we're in the process of identifying at the moment. And then we'll send to the Mass Historical Commission to review and get their approval because they do hold a deed restriction on the house. Um, our initial conversations with them, it's all in the basement and in the walls as far as we know, so they should have no problem with it. The only time it will you know, come into play is if we have to go into a wall, um, change anything because of outlets or lighting or something like that, but we're not anticipating any major review issues. Um, the phase two is what this project is, this proposal is focused on, um, and what I'm considering the critical issues. In this case, um, and the full scope of the project has grown a little since my proposal, but um, all of the items that we're trying to do are crucial to the operation of Wisteria Hearst as a historic program, public space, a performing center, but the critical ones are the ones that are causing a public safety hazard or causing a hazard to the house um, due to fire uh, threat. So that's the two 1930s era panel boards in the main house basement, two 1950s panel boards in the main house basement, one 1930s panel board in the music room, which is the one, if you've ever seen it, has open current fuses, um, so you can just open it. It's the worst. Anyways, replace <laughs> the um, malfunctioning fixtures in the main house. Like I was saying, there are some lighting fixtures, some outlets, some switches that are causing issues. Um, in the past, before my time, I know there's been some sparking and things like that. So we've put some fixtures and outlets out of commission totally. So bringing those back on board. Um, finding out through a program, um, electrical programmatic study, where we need other outlets, where we 
need extra load to keep our operations safe. Areas like the offices, like I was talking about. Um, and then um, all of this will be, again, reviewed by our historic preservation um, consultant while it's going on so that if issues arise that we didn't anticipate in it, there's a preservationist on hand to kind of um, give the okay or review different options for how to proceed. Say if we did find we had to break into a wall, um, again, I don't think that's what's going to happen, but they would be on hand to make sure that we were following best practices. Uh, these are just some pictures of what we're talking about. These are the 1950s eras ones in the main house basement. Um, this is the one in the music room that I was talking about that's open current. I had trouble getting a good picture because I don't even like to open it um, particularly. Yes? Yeah, just uh, for the committee here, I can help it. This one right here, what, what you see, the, the copper, the three vertical fixtures there, those are called bus bars. Those are open, live, current. Somebody touches those, it can kill them. And, and the, oh, sorry. <laughs> right, I'm telling that, that, yeah. that, 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 yeah. that right, that, that right there is one of the worst things you can imagine finding behind that wooden cabinet right there. Yeah, and I learned from Bob that there's also arc danger, so you don't even have to touch it. Um, and we, it is locked, it's in a different area, but that is the main reason that we've reduced, um, uh, programming in the music room from what you might have seen five years ago um, is that we just don't want to use the outlets uh, prior to the last few years if like fuses were blowing and we would have to call an electrician in just to change a fuse um, and so since we've in in the last few years we just really don't use the electrical um, that's also not ideal because it involves um, stringing extension cords to fuses that can take it so this is yeah, it's fundamental for, what we're talking about. For the committee and for the public, just to change those fuses, you need to wear gloves mm -hmm. and probably fiberglass tongs. <clears throat> There's a special tool, to, yeah. To, right. Just to change a fuse yeah. and not lose your life. <laughs> yeah. Um, and this is a picture of the working electrical, the um, lighting panel for that music room. Again, if you've never seen it, this is what we actually use to turn on lights for that space. Um, I don't think it's super great. I uh, would love to see this change. Uh, part of our full project is to also install performance grade lighting. Um, we can actually reduce our electrical load by putting in LEDs, by putting in um, dimming lights, which we don't have. If you have ever been to a concert, I'm sure you're with me that you would love to see a choice between lights off and lights fully bright. Um, that is, as you'll see, it's not what I'm asking CPA funds for, um, but is part of it. Um, and so this is represents something I'm really excited about too, is having Having flexible lighting in our spaces. Um, the additional construction items other than those critical ones include just what I said, um, the installation of performance quality lighting in the music room, also uh, installation of improved fire exit signage and lighting. Historic homes have um, a very specific set of guidelines that they adhere to. Uh, but I think, and so uh, we did do a walkthrough with the fire department two years ago in the same planning phase that we were in when we uncovered the depth of this problem. Um, and so we know we're up to code, but I think we could do better, especially given that we're using it as a cultural space, as a performance space. So um, we talked with our engineers about looking into options that won't interfere with the historic integrity of the site, but will provide a little bit safer experience for people. Um, and then auditory accessibility features, which will bring us up to ADA code, again, for using that space as a public performance area and presentation gathering space. Those items um, are more asked for um, in our grant, which I'm hoping CPA will help us match from the Mass Cultural Council. So those are also items that they are really in, um, uh, uh, Sorry, they're really uh, into funding and including in plans, so I would be excited to get these funds to help us secure that grant, which would help take the space even further as a usable space. 
Uh, this picture of the music room for anyone who's watching from home or, or in here who's not seen it. This is the main space that I'm talking about. This is where that very old panel board is. This is where the lighting is either on or off. And this is where we do, you know, I'd say at least 70% of our programs that get the biggest crowds. Um, it's really, really well used. Even if you don't see things on our calendar, um, the public schools use it for professional development. Schools use it for their graduations. There's all kinds of stuff happening there, probably, you know, even in a season like this, two or three times a week, and in spring and fall, probably more like four or five times a week. Um, included in the total costs again, um, which again have grown a little bit since I submitted this grant um, because of those add-ons like auditory, ADA, um, accessibility features. We have included contingency funds because again, once we're in there, we want to be able to finish this project. We don't want to stall out. Um, and we have included o some overhead funding. And then something with Wisteria Hearst is that um, even though we're um, a city department, um, could you just go back one? Uh, we do use our revenue to pay our staff, um, especially. So we run as a museum. Uh, a lot of our overhead comes from revenue use of the music room, of meeting spaces in the historic space. Um, and so the fear would be, again, you know, if we had to close for any extended length of time, I would not want that to um, destroy the momentum that we have built over the last few years. Um, and I would not want to have to lose capacity to come and jump right back in with this new facility. Uh, those, um, those pieces of this project are not included in CPA. So you'll see them in a big project budget, but I just want to be clear that, I, that CPA funds are going to be going to the critical construction components. But again, it will help leverage some of these other grant sources and campaigns that we're doing that will help us get to this goal. Um, this is just an overview of the, what I was just talking about, where the different funds will be applied. So you can see um, most of them are, are pending or in progress or secured already. Um, again, that's the totals. You see the, the bigger cost, I think, than what was in my original application here. Um, and all of it at this point, other than the public campaign, which is ongoing, um, is out and pending. And all of it will be determined at the same time. So hopefully, if it all comes through, we will have this money in July. We'll be able to just jump right in. Um, my timeline has the work happening in January of 2021, just to give time for those reviews, give time for the preservation consultant to look on, and um, to make sure that we don't disrupt the busiest time at Wisteria Hearst fall um, and winter are our busiest times. And a lot of those programs don't need to take place in the music room. So it's a little bit aligned with um, least impact on our public service aspect. Um, and the alternatives, there really aren't any in this case. Um, it is something that needs to be done. Um, and we're going to do it. Uh, the only alternative would be for us to um, close indefinitely when it got to the point where things were feeling dangerous enough. And I would put that probably at next year, um, the way that things are going right now. Um, and we would do it. We would, we would just cease doing programs in the spaces. We wouldn't stop existing as an entity, and we would put all our resources towards raising that money. Um, but again, as an uh, entity of our size, closing would just um, be really, really hard to reopen from. All right. Thank you. Uh, it's not setting, it's been gradual. So last year, uh, we were thinking it was pretty stable. This year, I've seen a lot more um, disruption to service, um, even just in the fuses that are in the main house basement, which we haven't had that many problems with before. So it's a total guess. I mean, it's a guess from, I was going to say living there, but I, <laughs> working there and spending a lot of time there and interacting with the site, we're just seeing a lot more things go wrong. Um, if anyone knows our Nutcracker performance, that's, a, that's the event that we've retained that has outside lighting. And this year, um, even that was having trouble with the lighting, we had to rest lights, we had to do a lot to keep it safe. So um, I just, I know, I think in my mind, I would not be able to do another Nutcracker, and that's sort of the, the canary in the coal mine moment. Mike? Yeah. So the, the leveraged funds, the other grant money that you said would be contingent upon this, what's the total dollars involved there? Is that uh, Yeah, I requested, that's 160,000 that I requested. 
All right, so uh, it's just budget of 353 397 yeah, it's gone up. It's gone up. Um, I added in the the what wasn't included in this total was um, some of the accessibility additions and some of the fire lighting and things like that. The additional pieces. So it, it's just right now the one grant that's contingent. Mm -hmm. It's just a one grant um, that's contingent that needs a match. We have the rest of that match in hand already, so this would just put us over the edge. Um, but and and that. This grant and um, that grant and what we have in hand, I, th I think, would allow us to do those critical pieces and move ahead. Um, so it's a, it, it, they are a little bit more aggressive asks than I would normally do. But um, again, we need it to come in all at once in one chunk um, and be kind of intertwined in that way. OK, you lost me a little bit on that. Mm -hmm. if, if we don't, if you don't get the 104 from us, mm -hmm. you lose the whole 160. Mm. Yeah, uh, pretty much because I don't have another. What we would do is try and get get it through public uh, campaign. We would have, uh, yeah, pretty much. We need to have a match in hand when um, the grant award is given in July. So we will be campaigning. We will be raising money. It'll depend on how much we've raised by June of that. I think it's a real stretch for us to have raised that much by June. Um, it's possible that we could that they might lower the amount and give us what we have raised to. Um, we are also putting an application for a CDBG round for this fiscal year as well. Um, so if that comes through, that would help. Um, that could be a match for that too. All right. So in order to get the 160, mm -hmm. you have to raise 160. Yes. Correct. The 104 doesn't guarantee you the 160. It's just a piece of it. Yes, but we already have um, the rest in hand right now. That would So the 104 would get us to 160 without any other fundraising um, because we had one private donation, and the um, CDBG from the previous fiscal year would count towards that. OK. Anybody else? Any other questions? Anybody in the audience have comments or questions on this proposal? Maybe I'll, I'll just add one thing, Mike. You saw the, the photograph of the small panel in the music room with the exposed bus bars. Yep. There's two other 1930s vintage panels in the basement of the main house that are larger, multiples of that, that have the very same configuration. So those ones are, they're all pretty scary. Probably with some big Frankenstein switches on them too. Uh, yes. Yeah. And and Kate has done a good job since we really brought this to her attention. She's really locked off all those spaces because nobody should, as you said, nobody should be getting close to those. They right. take their own life yep. um, in their hands. Yes, Bob Parent, I'm the city engineer. No. Sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? All right. Thank you. Next up, next up we have the Holyoke merry-go-round, uh, horse restoration. Uh, Maureen and Jay and their request is for twenty-six thousand one hundred and seventy dollars, uh, or six thousand five hundred and forty-three dollars per horse. Hi. Hi. Good evening. <laughs> As you can tell, I don't look like Maureen. No. She sends her greetings and her regrets. She's down with the flu. So she asked me to come here in her stead. Um, so thanks for having us here. Um, mainly, what, oh, sorry, I'm Jay Ducharme, and I'm on the board of the Hayok Merry-Go-Round. Um, essentially, we want to start restoring the outer horses, the standards, the big ones. Uh, we've done 21 of the jumpers. Um, over the past 20 years, um, we, do, we can only do a couple a year using our money that we raise through the preservation fund. And um, we send them out, they come back, we put them on, we try to send out some more. The standards are double the size and they're a lot more expensive to do. And um, we are raising money through the preservation fund but we need to offset those costs some other way because we're not gonna be able to swing it. So we're asking to do four horses, two of the smaller standards, two of the bigger standards to start that process. 
they are a little more critical to do because the, the jumpers are on a post and they're pretty secure. We don't have to worry about those. The standers stand on their legs and some of the legs broke when they were at Mountain Park and the way they were restored is they just wrapped Bondo around it. Um, so we would like to finally secure those horses so that they, we know they're safe and we know they're secure. Um, it's a pretty involved process to get those things off there. It requires a lot more time than removing the jumpers. So it's a little bit more of a, a cost involved there. We, um, there are no preservation restrictions on this thing. Um, we envision a six to eight month time frame to get it done. Once we contact the Bristol Carousel Museum, who does the restoration, they're one of the only places on the East Coast who can do carousel restoration. The, I think the nearest one, the other one, would be out in Ohio. Um, so we are actually able to save a little money by driving the horses down there ourselves and then dropping them off and then going down there and picking them up, which is nice. We envision about a six to eight month time frame to get all that done. Um, follows all the Secretary of Interior guidelines for historic restoration. Um, and this is a restoration that's not a touch-up. There are questions about well, why can't you just touch them up? Well, these horses require a little more than touch-up. Again, Bondo, you can't touch up. You, that really has to be repaired properly so the, the heel doesn't break again. Um, the horses are made of basswood, which is a very soft wood. That's the way they were carved. Um, they're covered with Japanese oils. When... Fire alarm? <laughs> Oops, amber alert. Yeah, I just got that too. Nice to know this system works. So the basswood is very soft. When they're painted, they're usually painted with Japanese oils. Uh, when John Hickey repainted them all before the, the ride was reassembled, he decided to paint them with latex. And all the latex is just peeling off like dead skin. So since the outside horses are the show horses, that's the one that people notice, we really want those to look nice, not like they're dead skin coming off the horses. So. That would be nice to do. So it requires more than just a touch-up. It requires stripping down. And what the Bristol Carousel Museum does, they go all the way down to the original coat of paint that was on the horse, which is about five layers deep. And then they can document that, how it was originally done by Philadelphia Toboggan Company. And then they repaint them from the ground up. And they also fix any broken joints. Thank you, Amber Alert. So um, here are some handouts for you that show what the process of restoration is. And we, John Hickey's vision for the carousel was to bring people to back to downtown Holyoke. He didn't like the fact that everybody was leaving downtown and we're there along with the Children's Museum, the Volleyball Hall of Fame and the Visitor Center um, and if you're not aware another little attraction for the Visitor Center I'm building a scale model of Mountain Park that's on display there that's still ongoing and that's actually been bringing Charlie said it's been bringing more people into the Visitor Center than he's seen in years which is good so that's what we want we want to draw people back down there with the canal walk and the merry-go-round has been helping to do that but we have to keep it in really good shape because people don't want to come and see a beat up carousel. And we are in an interesting position because even though it's an historic work of art and there are only 20 of that style of carousel left in the entire world, um, it's a working museum piece. So it gets a lot of use. We, we're putting through about 30 to 50,000 people a year on that ride right now. So that's a, a lot of feet climbing all over it. Any questions? Thank you. Does anybody have any questions? Of, of course. Hello, Elaine. Elaine, use the mic. I'll talk loud. Um, I just want to know it, the amount, the $26,000 plus, is per horse. No, that's for the entire, all four horses. All four horses? Yep. Oh, okay. okay. Six grand or six five. Six five. Yeah. It's 
Six, says what? Six, six, six five hundred. Oh, six five hundred. Okay. Yes. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Six for four. And are there more horses that will need to be restored after these are done? Yes. Yeah. So that will put it at twenty five horses when those are done. There are forty eight horses. Okay. So this is an ongoing project. It is an We're ongoing just going project. Going for the most of um, needed or the ones that need it the most on this round. Correct. Great. Thank you. You are welcome. Any other questions? Um, you had said the other 21 were previously restored using um, an alternative funding source. Can you Preserva Our preservation fund. So That's can you explain why rate. that wouldn't be an appropriate source of funding for this round of four horses? It could, but it's going to take us a while because these are much more expensive than the other horses. The other horses, the jumpers, were costing us around 3600 a piece. Um, these are double the cost. And we, we are also facing using our preservation fund for the building itself um, because the hardware, I mean, it's 25 years old now. Hard to believe it's been in downtown for a quarter century. But the hardware on the building is starting to fail, so we need to fix that. Um, I actually have 3D printed inserts for what are called the pillow blocks. The crankshafts sit in a pillow block and it's iron on iron. That's the way PTC designed it. And after 90 years, the iron is starting to wear out. Well, you can't get replacement parts for these things anymore. So we've got to figure out a way to try to preserve what we've got. So I've designed little plastic inserts that I can 3D print that'll pop into the pillow blocks and drop the crankshaft onto the plastic to try to cut the wear. So we're trying to save it that way as well, trying to do whatever low cost thing we can do. But again, we've got a lot of other mechanical issues to deal with besides just the horses. So any help we can get is greatly appreciated. Um, you said there's no preservation restriction on the carousel, is that? Correct. Um, and, and why, did, I'm just curious what the relevance or the importance of that. That was one of the questions oh, okay. that was oh, right. um, okay. asked of us. Okay. Um, are there any restrictions on preservation uh, of the carousel okay. in our Because um, actually what we did do in our last, um, the last funding round is for non-city projects, we did require a preservation restriction. Um, so when I was asking that, I was asking, you know, are you open to a preservation restriction? for a set period of time. You know. I would have to defer that to Maureen because okay. I don't know what that means. If okay. you can explain it to me, <laughs> maybe I can tell you. It would just protect the, you know, um, the, the work and, you know, so that it wouldn't, it couldn't be sold or changed in some way. Um, that actually, I think, we would be very open to. Yeah, for a set period of time. Yeah. Yep. And it requires yep. public access to the space. Yes. Yeah, so it would basically protects the investment of the public, you know, public funds. Yeah. That's actually great. And we have actually brought up at the board meetings applying um, for a making it a National Historic Landmark because in its current condition, it's pretty much the only PTC carousel left in that condition with all the original artwork on it, which you don't see because the artwork was painted on cardboard. And most of the merry-go-rounds didn't have a building like what they had at Mountain Park. So most of them were open to the elements and the cardboard would disintegrate and they just slap fiberglass on top of it. So we have all the original artwork, we have all the original machinery, which you don't find either. So we probably would be a candidate for a historic landmark status on that as well. The music restored? The band organ was fully restored about 10 years ago. We had a power surge. What we did is um, we have what are called tracker bars in that thing, and it uses paper rolls. The tracker bars were wearing out, and so the music was constantly mistracking. So when we got together with the only band organ restorer on the East Coast, he said, why don't you go to a MIDI system, so a, a digital audio system. So um, it would be computer controlled. It would still play the organ. It wouldn't be canned music. It would still play the organ, but it would be triggered by a computer. And he said, that way, you wouldn't have to play the rolls anymore, and it would last forever. And we said, great, do it. So that was an enormous amount of money that we had to spend on that. And then about five years after we got that done, the ride got hit by a power surge, and it blew all the solenoids in the MIDI system. And so now it's non-functional. We actually can go back to the rolls, and we have played them occasionally. But again, the tracker bar doesn't work well. To redo that now would cost about 8000 
So we're trying to find the funds to do that as well. It's always about money. Yeah. Anybody else in the audience have a comment, questions? Dennis, you're good. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Thank you. All right, next up we have uh, Bob Parent, stained glass windows, City Hall restoration, um, and Olivia, friends of City Hall, are requesting $80,000. Julie Sloan out of North Adams, one of the top stained glass people in the country to evaluate the stained glass windows in the City Hall. As you may know, they all originate from 1876. They were all created by Samuel Rett out of Boston, one of the top stained glass designers, creators at that point. Um, Julie put together these summaries that you've seen before, indicated that all windows were in poor condition. She talked about the windows being in danger of failing, particularly during high winds. And indicated also that the windows had, there had been attempts in the past to restore the windows, but some of the attempts actually did more damage to the windows than good. I'll talk about window numbers, but just to orient you, this is a, the footprint of the city hall. The front of the city hall is on the bottom. The back of the city hall is on the back and the, the top of the screen. And each one of these windows are numbered. The windows that we've been working on so far are on the right side of the screen or the west side of the city hall and the, the windows obviously that we'll need to be working on in the future on the east side. So we completed our first project. I won't take any credit for it. I wasn't working with the city at that point. Olivia and others um, worked very hard on that project to make that happen. Um, there were two windows restored at that time and three windows that were removed. These windows are the large windows you see on both sides of the auditorium here in the City Hall. Um, so five of the windows ultimately were touched, three of them taken down, crated, stabilized, and there they sat for the past couple of years. The restoration work was done by Serpentino out of Newton. The removal work was done by Guarducci Stained Glass out of Great Barrington. And we received funding from the city, from Mass Historical Commission, and from the Friends of the Holyoke Public Library at that point. We have a project that we received funding for this year through a combination of CPA funds, uh, $75,000 in CPA funds, $55,000 in mass historical funds. We also did receive an earmark through Representative Vega's office that expired at the end of fiscal 19. However, Representative Vega was able to refile that earmark as a continuation and it was approved in the governor's supplemental budget that was approved in December. And essentially what they did was they took that earmark and they extended the effective date for that through the end of the current fiscal year. 
The problem with that was that we had three different funding sources on different time schedules. The earmark was on fiscal 19, CPA funds, and Mass Historical were on fiscal 20, and they just didn't jive. We couldn't, we had to put them all together in the same time frame. So what is happening right now, phase two project, window number three. Um, you may or may not have heard that in the middle of, Nova in middle of October, October 13th, or excuse me, October 17th, uh, we had very high winds over Wednesday night into Thursday morning. Um, we got a call, I was actually out of the office that day, but we got a call that something's happening with one of the windows and this is what we saw that day. Uh, this is window number three. Uh, you can see at the bottom of the screen, we actually were fortunate. This is one of the key elements of the window. It's the face, the head of the, the figure in the, in the stained glass window. That head was dangling there. And we were able to get Julie Sloan to come on site within a couple of hours, set up staging. We were able to get that piece of glass taken out of, taken out of the window so it didn't crash to the floor and create more damage. We did lose some of the um, uh, background glass around the figure, but we didn't lose the figure itself. <coughs> so when that happened, we were out to bid for this phase of work. We redid what the priorities were in the bid form. We wanted to make certain that we took that window out. So we ultimately are taking window number three out. And in fact, that has been taken out. That was taken out several weeks ago, is now crated, stored for future restoration. Windows number 9 and 11, which were taken out back in 2015, are in Great Barrington right now in the beginning processes of being restored. They will be reinstalled in the spring. And then we had budget that allowed us to take out the two small windows at the back of the City Hall, window 6 and 7, and the large multiple unit window at the front of City Hall. So as part of this ongoing project, we'll be taking those three windows out, creating them to protect them for the future. This is what window three used to look like. That's the figure that was dangling in, in space on the 17th of October. So what Julie had predicted back in 2011 actually happened this year. So what we're requesting, and we understand, you know, it's a request. Um, the committee may not be able to provide all the funding we're looking for, so we've put together a couple of different approaches depending on, on what might happen with funding sources. If we were successful in obtaining $80,000 in funding from Mass Historical, and we will be applying for that again this year, and through CPA funds, these are our priorities. We would um, get the west side of the City Hall finished, so we'd restore window number 12, which is currently in storage, we would restore window number three, which is the one that again failed this, this uh, fall, and then we would create um, the remaining windows so that all the windows that existed in City Hall have either been restored or at least stored and created at that point. We, a requirement um, of Mass Historical in this committee as well is to have a preservationist involved, making certain the work is done correctly so when the work is done it's not we're actually, we're not going backwards, we're going forward. Um, like this phase, we may need to try to find an outside source of funding, either through city funds or um, earmark funding for the preservation. This mass historical money cannot be used for those funding. It's an in ineligible cost, so there needs to be another funding source. If we are only able to obtain CPA funding, because again, we have no guarantee of, of attaining the mass historical funding, our priority would be to at least remove and create the remaining windows. That's about a $30,000 cost, and we might have enough money left to then restore windows six and seven. If we only had $30,000, our next step would be to take all the windows out, because that's, that's really what Julie recommended back in 2011, and what you know, it's, the proof has shown to us is necessary to protect what's there. Future projects, you know, like as what the gentleman said earlier, you know, Money's always the issue. With money, we can get lots of things done. This project won't be done. It will have to continue in multiple phases. Depending on whether we're successful in this phase or not, we could be requiring another 450000 to maybe as much as $600,000 to finish the entire city hall. Each one of those large windows to restore costs sixty dollars to $70,000. 
we put when we put the project out to bid we got three bids from three very qualified firms all within a couple of thousand dollars of each other so we're we're pretty confident that that that's the real cost so that's our project our schedule again as I indicated we will apply to mass historical um, timeline CPA grants are awarded typically in April uh, mass historical money is not awarded until June, so there's a little bit of a time lag there in terms of knowing how the two funding sources might come together. If we're successful, we'd bring Julie Sloan back on board as a preservationist, and then we'd get the, the, the specs out and ready out. And we've done this a couple of times now, so it doesn't take us very long to pull these things together to get it out to bid. We do the same thing we're doing this year, which is to bid it into the fall so the work can happen from the winter into the springtime. What I have. Thank you. Any questions on the committee? <laughs> We're in the wrong business. I have a comment. A comment. Uh, that's that's good to know about the cost of each window to restore them, because back in 2011 when we did that study, that was approximately what they said at the time. And I'm glad to hear the cost hasn't, <laughs> you know, gone up too much because you know it's stayed reasonable so that's a good thing it's all relative yeah it's a lot of money to repair it's still money. a lot of money but yeah. and it was a lot of money then and <laughs> too um, I'm just wondering I, I've been I was looking at window eight recently and it like the the style of the figure looks so different from the other windows is that because of just I mean is that really the original window or was it restored in a different way just curious I'm by no means of my, I'm an engineer. I can talk better about all oh, the okay. panels. I can talk about stained glass windows. It looks more three-dimensional, the figure, than I know yeah. Julie did indicate that there are two different styles of windows. Some of them reflect the city of Holyoke's history, and some of, are, some of them are less reflective of the city of Holyoke, and I don't know if that fits into it. So I, I don't have the okay. full... Just curious. There is, if we go back to the original assessment in 2011, there's a summary of each one of the windows and the stories that are behind each one of the windows. Amy, from our from our study, those are the original windows. Every 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 window is the is the authentic window, original one, original to the building. I don't know. Remember what what eight is? It's over here on this back. Yeah, I don't know. It's just um. It's just that the figure looks so different. The hair is more realist than, you know, and the whole the look of the style of the figure is so different. Look. That's why I was curious. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what the name of that particular window is, okay. but I know it's number eight on this diagram. That so. was one of the first first ones that we did. Number eight's one of the first ones. The first one. Oh, she was, uh, the first one was the one who had her, her midriff, her, her whole midriff was gone, oh. was blown out. So uh, her head was intact, but the, 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 her midriff was gone. So it, it landed uh, somewhere uh, in the building, but that was, um, I think, before Julie got here. No, she, she was part of that. She was definitely part of it. Oh, yes, yes, but the, the midriff was gone. Oh, you mean uh, the, the midriff? midriff the midriff oh, right, was yeah. the, uh, the, yeah. that had fallen out of that window. Um, exactly, yeah. And, uh, the custodians didn't have any idea where the parts were, so we don't even know when that happened. So she was all restored, and they uh, it, it's really uh, painted glass. It's, it's uh, not particularly stained glass. It's a whole explanation. It's, she goes through pages of it, but it's, it's painted. So her, she was redone and uh, matches, but it'll, we'll have to take a look okay. again at it. Thank you. Anybody else? I think anybody in the audience any comments or questions? All right. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you Thanks again. Thank you, Olivia. Thank you. <coughs> All right. Next up. Next up. <laughs> Matt and Sarah from Holyoke Housing Authority requesting two hundred thousand dollars for the Jackson Street first time home buyer project.
So my name is Sarah Meyer Zimbler. I'm the Director of Development at the Holyoke Housing Authority, and I'm here to talk about the Jackson Street First Time Home Buyer uh, Project. So um, the piece of property that we're going to be talking about today, you can see on the map, is at the corner of Chestnut and Jackson Street. This has been a vacant lot for decades, and the Housing Authority has tried to acquire it uh, for most of that time unsuccessfully. However, uh, last year we were able to purchase the property and are now the owners. So we have uh, a couple of different plans for the parcel. We are looking to expand our current parking lot um, that services the Falsetti Towers building and our administrative offices. We are a regional training center, uh, so we would um, like to, to put in some additional parking for that purpose. Um, but for the CPA application, we're looking at constructing two new single family homes along Jackson Street, which would look out on the park across the street. Um, so this proposal is a joint proposal from the Holyoke Housing Authority and the Greater Springfield Habitat for Humanity. Um, the idea is that the Housing Authority will construct one of the homes and Habitat for Humanity will construct the other. Um, and the idea is for both homes to be constructed in the style of the Churchill homes, which are right across the street, um, to create a consistent feel for the neighborhood. Uh, we did apply for some funding from the Massachusetts Housing Partnership, and we were awarded some funding to do a survey and topographic work, which is currently um, underway. So um, we think that this will be um, an important project. The, the two homes will both be sold to low-income families um, that will be below, at 80% or below, of the area and median income. Um, so the, the, the plan will both reduce, you know, turn a, what was once a vacant lot into um, opportunities for low-income um, property owners. It will create continuity in the neighborhood, create new tax revenue for the city, um, and again, provide opportunities for, for the two low-income families. So trying to keep it short and simple, but happy to answer any questions. Do we have any questions on the committee? I'm sorry. Busy. Uh, just, uh, I guess, that's awesome, right? Because I used to walk through that and go to school every day. <laughs> See, it grows real long. <laughs> we, 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 we cut the grass now. That's, that's one change. You, go. <laughs> um, you gotta get the mic closer. My bad. I don't want no problems. Um, so, uh, in, in regards to the the process for the applying for the, 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 the first time or for the low income residents, is there like, maybe a, this is not something for this, but like, could we, um, how do, it, it, the low income residents, will they be low income residents from like Holyoke, more or less? Is it, I guess that's what I'm trying to say. That, I guess that's what I meant. And just state your name. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, um, uh, Matthew Mainville, director of, director of the Hoyoke Housing Authority. Uh, what we would do is uh, we would provide preference to people that live in Hoyoke, okay. uh, as we have in the past. Obviously, we want to we're, we're, we're a community organization. We're looking for community funds, so we would look to make sure that we were uh, giving that, that opportunity back to community individuals, so that, that in fact, would be the case. Uh, that was pretty much it. Mike? Yeah, so two questions. So the, basically then the $200,000 is to build one house though, if Habitat's building the other one. Yep, to build the house, do the site work, uh, make sure that it's prepped. If, you, uh, if you're familiar with the site, there is a pretty big slope between, uh, the, you know, going from uh, Maple Street up to Sargent. So it's, there's, you know, there's some of that work that needs to be included in there. Uh, we have to do an A and R. We have to get a subdivision of the property uh, through the planning department. So there's some legwork that we have to do as well. Uh, and so the site work would be for both. Correct. For both buildings. Correct. Um, so let, let's say now, is there a restriction or anything in the deed that where 
if the person, the low income person that buys it, turns, can they turn around after a year and rent it to someone? That's a really good question. No, uh, what it, uh, the good thing is that we have a fairly long track record at providing uh, for sale home ownership opportunities to lower moderate income individuals. That was a mouthful. Um, so we understand uh, the need and the necessity to make sure uh, that public investment doesn't uh, end up being someone's gain. Uh, so we have and will put riders on this particular property that will make sure that it is your main occupancy and that you don't just turn the unit and flip it for a large profit at the end of the day. So we will have riders on it that will maintain its affordability and it will make sure that, I know one of the questions that was asked of us prior to coming down, uh, this would in fact be for folks at 80% or below area median income. I get, I get that, but what I'm saying here is not that they're going to flip the property, but that they're going to turn around and rent it and collect the rental income on it and continue to live in an apartment yeah. somewhere else in the town. Maybe, so. maybe I, I, didn't, uh, I didn't clarify, but uh, in there, there is language that says this has to be your primary residence. You cannot rent it to somebody else. Uh, you know, along with other other uh, clauses that would be included as well, that's a main focus of making sure that it's not meant to be an income property for people. So yes, that will in fact be in there. And what would happen if someone was caught renting it? Well, we would take legal action. You know, you can enforce uh, those types of riders, so we would do that. And you know, we would have to determine through the housing court. Uh, you know what the ramifications would be whether or not we would be able to seize the property back if there would be financial uh, Repercussions, but you know those those things would be determined as we go through court in housing housing court Has this happened? No It has it's, uh, up in Churchill where the 60 homes that we constructed and sold No, we haven't seen that happen So working at One Holyoke, they do it for 20 years. If they build a house and they sell it to you, you have to sign the deed and you have to live in that house for at least 20 years. If not, then they take the house back and you owe them money. So it's kind of the same That's the same thing. Yeah, it's yeah. kind of the same thing. Okay. And I don't think anybody's ever got their house foreclosed and, you know, throughout the time. I'm but relatively I'm sure you're right. They haven't, but I'm wondering how many are <laughs> no, 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 I'm being I'm rented out and no action. Yeah, that, no so action has been taken. No, that yeah. part right there, I, I'm with you on that, but yep. that's a whole nother ball game. That's hard to manage. <laughs> right. That's the point. Yeah, that's a whole nother ball game. Okay. Um, we would have to have an affordable housing restriction on it, so maybe that restriction probably would make, you know, selling or renting, you know, Actually, I don't know if it would oh, have an impact on it, but um, that's something our city solicitor would have to work on. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, uh, to just make uh, Mike, uh, all those considerations that you have are all in the Churchill homes. All the homes that we built, they all have contained, uh, um, and Matt can give you a better idea, but they all contain language that says you can't sell it unless for a certain period of time. You can't subrent it. This is yours. You own it. And if you do anything else. We're going to take you to court, and you're going to be responsible for all the, for all those things that you've caused. You've gone back on your word of the contract. When you sign this contract to buy the home, all those conditions that you refer to are in the contract. I Matt can drain certainly to allay your fears a little bit. Matt can address that more specifically, but to allay your fears and the fears of the uh, of the committee, all that language we put in there, just like Churchill Homes, same thing. I. I totally get that and I understand that the language is there. I'm just concerned that it's not being enforced, that there's no enforcement going on of the language. That's my concern. Like I said, you know, we, we actively uh, 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 make sure that those regulations that we have in place are in fact being kept up and we have had uh, situations where people have sold their homes prior to the uh, expiration of the affordability clause, and we have had to recapture funds that way. Uh, so we, we try and make sure that we do our due diligence. You know, I th and I, I think, uh, you know, not to toot our own horn, but, you know, I think the Churchill neighborhood has kind of stood the test of time. You know, that if, we, if you can think back, uh, those were first started back in 1998, and so we're talking a significant period of time, and I think that you would see 
a demonstrated uh, uh, reduction in the quality of housing if we in fact had uh, absentee landlords and renters in those home ownership units. So, you know, we're, we're committed to making sure that, uh, that, that we, we put a good product on the street. Okay. So thank you for the question. Yep. Anybody else questions? Anybody in the audience have any questions or comments on this proposal? No? All right. Thank Th you thanks much. for your consideration, folks. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Last up, Armor and Company Restoration, Dennis Lazariaga, requesting $90,000. And this is again back into the historic Sarah. preservation category. Good evening. Can you just uh, wait one second? Um, one second. Wait, my name is Dennis Luce. Oh. Dennis, can you just wait one second? Sorry. We're catching up on the minutes. Perfect. For HHA? Yes. There's two? No, sorry. Did you say you spent time in that building? No, I spent my whole Should neighborhood I, uh, is about to change. Should I talk in the microphone? <laughs> <laughs> So uh, my name is Dennis Luceriaga. Uh, I'm here on behalf of the Armor and Company project. Um, so um, thanks for allowing me to present. I think I'm up against some tough competition. <laughs> um, so uh, basically what, what you have in front, I'm sorry that I got these late. There were some questions that the committee had and uh, I, we got to them today. So. Uh, I'm happy to wait a bit if you want to look through them, or I can just proceed. I think we're I think we're good, Dennis. Okay, Go all right. Do your thing. So, um, I mean, I can refresh you on, uh, you know, the historic importance of the building. Um, it, uh, the Armor and Company, uh, the Armor and Company, meat packing and provisions was a Chicago company. Actually, it still exists. I think it's owned by a Chinese company. Mm -hmm. um, they uh, basically had outposts throughout the country. Uh, Holyoke had this one building that basically would take sides of beef and whatnot uh, f uh, and cut it, you know, basically butcher it and then redistribute it. Um, and they also, I think, believe they, they had a uh, store on the uh, front of the building. Um, so what we're uh, hoping to do with this is with these ninety thousand dollars that we're requesting is to do improvements on the facade, which are pretty much badly needed. Um, there's a lot of brick repointing that needs to be done. The windows uh, are not, you know, they're they're modern windows. They need to be restored or completely removed and new ones installed that are historically accurate. Uh, same with doors, and then. Um, any anything that is not historically accurate, such as the uh, fire escape on the one side on Middle Street and also the uh, the ramp, would be removed. Um, but specifically, the uh, the funds that we're requesting is for the uh, brick repointing, the windows, the doors, and also the restoration of the the two signs that are depicted on the on the first color page. <laughs> Um, there is a list of how that is broken down. I, I, I believe uh, the committee had asked for some more detail on that. Um, so I could also, what I do want to address actually is the, the whole idea of a community, and I think every presenter tonight has touched on that in, in a certain way. And uh, what we're looking to do really is kind of bridge a gap that is still very much evident by really restoring in this case, Ray Street and the downtown portion of, of Holyoke, in a way that people, not, not only from outside of the city and even from within the city, not, not only come to certain select 
destinations for a one-time event, a one-off event, but come really maybe possibly for one event, but then after the event is over, maybe it's at Gateway for a concert or they go to Gateway for a meal, and then they decide just to stroll, take a stroll and see what else they could find. Um, and I, I think Jay mentioned that as well, is bringing people back. You know, the, the whole merry-go-round is a, a really an integral portion of that, and I think Wisteria Hearst is, is key. Um, it, this, this building is fantastic. I think every, every presenter tonight has really made a good uh, case. So we're, we're completely on that bandwagon. We're, we're looking to really make this, restore the city to a, a completely walkable city with destinations. And the Armour and Company building is in between uh, the Qubit, which is one thing we developed, Gateway, there's Paper City Studios, there's Parsons Hall, there's, I, you know, we see not only Ray Street, Main Street, High Street coming back, and I, I think that's happening already, and with any luck, we'll, my brother and I can be part of um, that revitalization, and hopefully the CPA can aid us in that goal. So I'll take questions. Dennis, what, what is this building going to be reused? Uh, this is not housing, correct? No, it's not. Um, we're currently exploring the possibility of having a, a food establishment, a restaurant or a cafe. Um, I, I think that would be its best use. It would also be a bit of a tough um, proposition when it comes to funding via a bank. Uh, banks are not very, very keen on, on funding restaurants because of the failure rate. But I think we have a good case for, um, for having a food estab establishment in there, and we would likely, we're actually actively now uh, researching what it would take to do that. We're, we're, we're talking to a few Con consultants, sort of loosely, I mean, there are more people that we know that are in the restaurant in industry, not so much people that, the paid consultants. Um, it, it would likely be a partnership with us as developers and a restaurateur that comes in, and possibly even, um, mm -hmm. we're actively speaking with, with a, um, a couple from Boston who has been involved in restoration of small buildings like this, and I've maintained a dialogue with them for a, about a year and a half, they came to us via the planning department, which is very good. I've, uh, so they're, they've been in the building. They, they are very interested in helping us or actually partnering with us to restore it. And they also agree that uh, some kind of food establishment, possibly with a, a combination with, with food education or you know, certainly creating jobs during construction and ongoing. So, so there are a couple of groups in the mix that we're maintaining a dialogue with. So we, we are hoping that a restaurant would be the best use for it. Um, so just to mention an, 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 another project which is completely separate from the Armour and Company is this project which you probably saw t in the um, later pages, the uh, Canal Row. This is something that is ongoing now. We're in serious dialogue with um, a, an anchor tenant. Um, with any luck, we'll be breaking ground this year, and it'll be four stories. It'll be um, the anchor tenant on the ground floor, and then three floors of uh, uh, market rate rentals, 45 units. So even though this is also still in the early phases, the, the financing, we've engaged architects, we've, you know, we're, we're in serious dialogue, as I said, with the anchor tenant. Um, once all that is said and done, in a way, we have built a bit of a community together with a qubit. It's almost like you know we are providing customers to this potential restaurant and to anybody you know to Gateway, any other establishment that wishes to open or has already opened on Ray Street or on High or on Main Street. I think you know w would benefit from this added volume of people, and, and hopefully it would entice other people to to move their businesses and their establishments to Holyoke. So we're, we're trying to demonstrate that Holyoke is viable. And I think we, we sort of have already with, the, with our first project with the Qubit. Is this building right here on the end on the front cover here, that's the HCC building? Yes, that's the, the Qubit that has um, the HCC culinary.
program on two floors, and then 18 market rate apartments on the third and fourth floor. Yeah, I knew that, but I wasn't sure if yeah, it was that the next floor. Yeah, yeah that, that way, exactly, that's the one right there. Yeah. Anybody else, any questions, Mike? Yeah, Dennis, the 18 market rate in the Cubit, uh, are those fully sold or fully rented? They're fully rented, and they, they, they were rented uh, before we even opened the building a year and a half ago. All and all as they come up, they, they fill immediately. So there's a demand. All at market rate? All at market rate, yes. Anything else? Any other questions? Fantastic, thank you. The audience has thinned out, so I think you're good. <laughs> thank That's you guys it. for sticking around. Okay. Appreciate it. Okay, you don't have any Jay, questions? Jay, nothing? <laughs> Do you want to show off your baby? <laughs> Everybody has. <laughs> All right, thank you, Dennis. Thank you very much. I appreciate thank it. You. Thank you. So that concludes the meeting. Our presentation yeah, all of you. for the day, correct? Yes. I was looking forward to meeting all of you and visiting with them. That's okay. Go ahead. No, no, no. Not <laughs> Um, we've spoken on the phone. I'm Amy Landau. Yes, I yeah. Know. Yeah, I know. It's weird that we didn't actually introduce ourselves. So thank you. Yeah. Nice to meet you. All right. So we got through the first of two days of presentations. Um, we're scheduled for 22nd, next Wednesday, same time. We probably don't know the place yet. So is there an we do know the place. It's it won't be here. It will be at the um, the annex uh, um, in, on the fourth floor conference room because there's a DGR meeting or something so like that. So we have to make sure we communicate that to the other oh, applicants I have. so yeah, that they I've know that done. they're coming to the right spot. Um, they know. <laughs> is there anything else that we need to discuss I today? Just ask, you know? I just want to ask one question: Is is are you going to be sticking with Wednesday nights as the meeting? Night from now till oh, yeah, I was yeah. Say that too. Oh, that's open to discussion. I don't think we've because I, I don't think we've said anything as far as future. It depends on the makeup of the committee on okay. the night of what works for who people. I guess we figure that out well, by that what we night did we schedule on. Decide on Wednesday. That well, was my understanding. Oh, I mean, let, let, me, let me finish. I need to know because I I can I'm going to change what I do on Wednesday nights so that I can be here. But I don't want to change it if we're not going to be. Well, here every Wednesday. I mean, I uh, not every Wednesday. think at the last meeting, Wednesday seemed to be the best night for people that were there that night. And and, and, and if that's so not true, then... Now, now that the spring semester is coming, right, the only classes that I could take were Wednesday nights that are night classes at UMass. So I will not be able to make Wednesday nights. I have night classes at UMass. Okay. Well, and why can't we do Mondays? Because you are, is I can't do Mondays. I have a prior commitment, which and yeah. I can't do Thursdays. So, so oh. look, where is I mean? I can do any other day. Uh, I mean, any I think. Other day. I I, I kind of like the idea of, me. you know, I I kind of like the idea of discussing it at each meeting. What our next yeah. what meeting yeah, works for people. <laughs> but if but but I think we had decided that Wednesday was apparently the best night for the majority of right this this is this is what we're struggling with yeah. so I, mean, it, I think we should I, w I would I would count on Wednesdays but we may have to the other option would be to say every other meeting will have a Tuesday or a Wednesday and then like I can miss some and Israel will miss some and we'll just have to pay Ryan to do the minutes when I'm not here. Although it's not just you, it's also Mimi that wouldn't be able to attend Tuesdays. Yeah, I'm just saying it's, you know, we might need to be flexible about that reality. I think. And that's okay, I'm just stating that for I, the record, that's okay. And my bad, I'm old, so I can only take night classes. <laughs> <laughs> I can't take day classes, and yeah, UMass only offers them on Wednesdays for the class that I need. What about next week? Next week is the first week of class. Oh, so you won't be here next Wednesday? Yeah, night. I just thought about that. Yeah. So I wasn't going to 
Well, I'm open to any suggestions. I mean, I, mean, I think everybody is open to trying to find the problem is you have really five, maybe I mean, four I, I, nights. I, I, I can don't want to be here on a Friday late. night or I'll Saturday be late. Or I so. can make it, but I'll be late because I think my class probably ends around 6 37 o'clock. Well, well, we could push back a little bit too. We could start yeah. at 6 30. That is another option. I mean, just right. to try to accommodate all that. Right. So just start, all right, then. that makes so, sense. So I then Not expect me to be there. So forward. come next week when you can yeah. get here, and then we'll can, at the end of that meeting we'll talk about okay. what our February meeting schedule is going to be, and we'll. Well, that'll be the whole back. spring, so it'll be straight. We'll try to push it back and. I would love to move it not to the third Wednesday, if possible. <laughs> it's duly noted. <laughs> There's an Irish Writers Book Club at the Forbes Library that's just started. We don't want to mess with that. Tell them the move. Tell them the move. I'll tell them. Right. I'll tell them you said Anything that. Anything else? Any other, other business so we're ready for next week? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. All right. Anybody have any motions they want to make? Yeah. Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor? Uh, Aye. Discussion. Aye. Aye. Call it a day. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.